Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to another round of uh, webinars in nephrology. I hope I am audible to all of you. Uh, in uh, our series of electrolyte disorders, we have uh, Dr. Ajay here with uh, uh, his slides and talk on hyperkalemia. For those who haven't uh, attended uh, one of his previous uh, crisp and brilliant talks, Dr. Ajay here is a leguminous from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. Subsequently, he did his medical training and nephrology education in Harvard Medical School, Boston. After a stint as a consultant in Fortis Noida, Fortis Scott Hospital in, in South Delhi, he is now in, in his own clinic, Vishwanath Vishwas Clinic at Noida. Dr. AJ, over to you for your yet another crisp and educated talk, hyperkalemia. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Gopesh, uh, for the introduction. Um, so my talk is going to be focused on these aspects. I'll start uh, with a little bit of uh, basics of uh, potassium, which we've covered in the last talk as well, but I'll uh, start with a little of that. We'll go over the causes of hyperkalemia, symptoms of hyperkalemia, some diagnosis and evaluation that goes along with the causes, and then we'll focus predominantly on the treatment of hyperkalemia. Um, as we've talked before, potassium is an uh, intracellular um, cation and uh, the concentration in the intracellular fluid or ICF is about 140 milliculans per liter. In the extracellular fluid, it's about 4 to 5 milliculans per liter. Uh, the body has a well-developed mechanism for defense against hyperkalemia and that is because even a uh, two um, glasses of orange juice would have 40 milliculans of potassium and if you take that together uh, within a few minutes and it only distributes in the extracellular fluid compartment your potassium would go from four to five uh, to six to eight and that would be uh, that would lead to severe hyperkalemia and could even lead to death so the body has developed mechanisms of uh, uh, kind of defense against development of this hyperkalemia and the first mechanism is buffering of this potassium inside the cell and this buffering is done by catecholamines predominantly beta 2 um, agonists and beta 2 receptors insulin and then the plasma potassium concentration also helps boost the buffering or uh, shifting of the potassium into the cell and then finally uh, the kidneys will get rid of the potassium and uh, whatever intake you have uh, during the day that will get excreted by the kidney and you come back into a steady state or in balance so that is kind of how uh, the body defends against hyperkalemia so there are two parts to it one is the cellular shift which is predominantly by the insulin and beta 2 uh, adrenergic receptors and beta 2 agonists and then the final is the renal excretion which requires aldosterone, the potassium concentration itself, and distal sodium delivery to help uh, get rid of the potassium. One of the key concepts which we've talked before also is that the body has a well-developed uh, adaptation to uh, oral potassium and oral intake. So in this, uh, the green line is uh, the plasma potassium level. Uh, the red is aldosterone level, the hormone level, and the blue is the urinary potassium excretion. And this is one of the classic experiments uh, done in 1990 um, in human subjects, volunteers, where uh, they started with 100 milliculans potassium intake every day. And so their potassium excretion here at the baseline is also 100 milliculans. And they have a baseline aldosterone and a baseline potassium of about 3.8. Uh, then their potassium intake was increased from 100 milliculans per day to 400 milliculans per day. And within the first uh, 24 hours, the serum potassium went up from 3.8 and uh, reached a peak on day two, which is around 4.8. Uh, during this time, the aldosterone level also went up and the urinary potassium increased uh, in response to the increased potassium uh, and the aldosterone level uh, that was there. By day 20, uh, the body had adapted to uh, the increased potassium intake and was now able to excrete the whole 400 milliculans and was now back in steady state. When it reaches steady state, the aldosterone level has gone back to the previous baseline and there is absolutely no increase in that aldosterone level. The potassium is also 
uh, much lower now that the body has adapted to it and the serum potassium has only gone up from 3.8 to 4.2 so despite a, a massive increase in the oral potassium intake from 100 milligrams all the way up to 400 milligrams a day the serum potassium has only gone up from 3.8 to 4.2 and the person did not develop hyperkalemia so in a normal person or in a normal subject no matter how much you increase their oral intake you will not develop hyperkalemia until unless there is an impaired excretion so that is one of the key take homes is that an oral intake by itself without additional factors is unlikely to cause uh, hyperkalemia and you have to have some additional hit or an additional uh, factor that is leading or developing or causing the hyperkalemia so what are the causes so the increase increased intake as i just showed is rarely the sole cause though it may contribute if you have a high potassium intake especially infants where they might get an IV bolus or a salt substitute or some other uh, or uh, they get a blood transfusion which is from an um, which has been in the fridge for a long period of time or in storage for a long period of time then the infants can have um, uh, hyperkalemia with that kind of a setup uh, the other is cellular shift or cellular lysis so tumor lysis rhabdomyolysis trauma hemolysis uh, will cause release of uh, potassium from the cell. Other uh, things that cause a shift of potassium, uh, whether it is metabolic acidosis, insulin deficiency, hyperosmolarity, beta blockers, exercise, digitalis toxicity, succinylcholine, these cause shift from potassium as well and can cause hyperkalemia. And then anything that causes a decrease in the urinary excretion of potassium, whether it is hypoaldosteronism, uh, either due to reduced secretion or a decreased response of the body to aldosterone, any kind of kidney disease, acute or chronic. And then if there is any selectively impaired potassium secretion, either due to a congenital abnormality or a channel abnormality or due to some drugs that selectively impair potassium secretion, that can also cause hyperkalemia. So let's take a case. So a 50 year old male with diabetes for five years uh, had a fever and got routine testing done in a lab in his village and from there he's referred to you for a potassium of six and has a normal creatinine of one his repeat potassium that is done in your lab is now four he has a hemoglobin of 10.4 some microcytic hypochromic anemia and wbc is 6.4 and a platelet count of 600,000. so what's his etiology of hyperkalemia is it an acute potassium shift is it pseudo hyperkalemia is it some Ayurvedic medicines that he's taken or is it diabetic type 4 RTA? So the clues uh, in this are um, that this is a pseudo hyperkalemia and the clue is that he's getting labs drawn uh, in his village and they are in India sending it to a central lab where there is a prolonged storage and that can cause pseudo hyperkalemia. In addition, he also has thrombocytosis, which can, can cause persistent release of uh, potassium in that storage phase as well, and can lead to uh, pseudo hyperkalemia. So, uh, pseudo hyperkalemia is due to potassium movement out of the cell during or after blood collection, and can be due to mechanical trauma when the venipuncture is done, due to repeated fist clenching with a tourniquet on or um, the most common for us in india is uh, all these centralized labs have collection centers all across india and the test is done in delhi so they collect it there ship it and uh, when the test is done by that time uh, you can have hyperkalemia due to that so it is something to be aware of and uh, if there is concern to recheck especially in a hospital lab where the test doesn't have that long a storage and then there are conditions with thrombocytosis or leukocytosis or even conditions like sickle cell in which you can have lysis of cell after the blood has been collected where that can cause pseudo hyperkalemia as well uh, an easy check is to do a plasma potassium at the same time as a serum potassium and that may uh, guide you uh, and tell you that you have someone who has pseudo hyperkalemia 
Another uh, cause uh, of uh, hyperkalemia is hypoaldosteronism, and there's a whole list of causes uh, that can cause hypoaldosteronism, uh, including hyporenemic hypoaldosteronism, predominantly with type 4 RTAs with diabetics, any renin angiotensin aldosterone blockade with the renin inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, aldosterone antagonists, all of them can cause hyperkalemia. Drugs like calcineurin inhibitors, NSAIDs, heparin, potassium sparing diuretics, and trimethoprim uh, can also cause hyperkalemia. A primary adrenal insufficiency or inherited disorders of uh, hypoaldosteronism uh, can also lead to um, hyperkalemia. And then there are distal tubule defects with obstructive uropathy, lupus, or sickle cell uh, that can also cause hyperkalemia. The symptoms of hyperkalemia are predominantly related to the resting membrane potential of the cell and any change in potassium can lead to changes in the membrane polarization and excitability and which predominantly leads to symptoms of neuromuscular uh, symptoms with weakness and paralysis or cardiac arrhythmias. So uh, the ECG has these classic changes that have been described and these are present on the left side. Uh, so you have a normal ECG on the top and then the first change uh, that can be seen in our peak T waves. Then you have a widening of the PR interval and widening of the QRS uh, with continued peak T waves. Then the P waves get lost uh, and so it looks like a junctional rhythm. And then you can, uh, with further widening of the QRS and then finally you have a sinusoidal wave. And then you can have uh, ventricular tachycardia, fibrillation, asystole uh, as well. So the diagnosis and evaluation, the first thing is you have to assess if someone is symptomatic. If someone is symptomatic, you have to treat first and the diagnosis and evaluation uh, will come later. Um, if someone has a history like we presented before, you have to think about pseudo hyperkalemia and consider uh, rechecking the potassium uh, or considering a plasma potassium as well. Most patients usually have an obvious cause uh, that can be identified or an obvious drug or uh, renal failure, which uh, will be the cause for their uh, hyperkalemia. Uh, if it is transient, then it's uh, possible that there is a cellular shift. Persistent hyperkalemia in the setting of normal renal function is almost always going to be due to hypoaldosteronism, either uh, due to decreased secretion or due to uh, decreased response uh, to the aldosterone. Uh, TTKG or transtubular potassium gradient is uh, no longer to be used for uh, evaluation of hyperkalemia and that's because uh, the um, authors who had proposed TTKG uh, did another study uh, looking at the underlying assumptions and uh, they found that there was a lot of urea recycling which um, um, means that their assumptions of uh, assessing the potassium gradient at the collecting duct were actually false and hence TTKG uh, is no longer recommended for evaluation of hyperkalemia. So now we'll move to uh, treatment and we'll start with a case. So this is a 68 year old female with uh, end stage kidney disease secondary to uh, Wegener's granulomatosis and has been on hemodialysis uh, with an AV fistula. She also has a history of atrial fibrillation for which she is on diltiazin. She went to her dialysis unit, but was found to have a heart rate of 150 and uh, her ECG there in the dialysis unit showed atrial fibrillation. So she was sent to the emergency and uh, did not undergo dialysis at that time. In the emergency, she is initially controlled on an esmolol drip and then transitioned to metoprolol oral with some bolus IV dosing and her heart rates in the 80s to 100s at that time. The potassium in the emergency room was 4.7. So she is admitted to uh, the ICU for monitoring and dialysis is planned now for uh, the next day. And you get called at 3.49 a.m. for uh, hypotension and unresponsiveness in this patient who also has now bradycardia. And the ECG that you see is this. So the features that you see is in addition to the bradycardia and the wide uh, absent P waves, a junctional rhythm, wide QRS, and this is now approaching a sine wave. So how do you approach or treat a patient like this who has uh, symptomatic hyperkalemia with significant ECG changes? So the first treatment goal for someone like this is that you have to stabilize the membrane. 
So, um, and the treatment for that is IV calcium. You can give calcium gluconate or calcium chloride. Calcium chloride has three times the elemental calcium of calcium gluconate, but it requires a central line because otherwise it will uh, damage the veins. Uh, the action of calcium starts within minutes and lasts about 30 to 60 minutes. The usual dose to start is to give a thousand milligrams, which is 10 ml of a 10% solution. The key is that you can repeat or you should repeat the calcium every five to 10 minutes until the ECG normalizes. So if you have someone like the ECG we just saw with almost a sine wave, um, you need to keep giving calcium every five to 10 minutes till the ECG normalizes. And if you give enough calcium, the ECG will normalize. So this is the same patient. Now um, the lab potassium was 8.1. Uh, we gave calcium, we gave insulin dextrose, and we give uh, bicarb and uh, beta agonist. Um, 18 minutes later, then you can see that the P waves have returned. The QRS is still um, wide, but it is narrower than before, but it is not normal. So we gave more calcium and another 10 minutes later, uh, if you look at the QRS uh, duration, it's 130 uh, milliseconds and now it's 116. The heart rate is also picked up, which was in the 40s is now 60. And um, the ECG is almost close to normal and there is uh, the bradycardia is also uh, better. Uh, so this patient then went to her dialysis at 5 a.m. and the hyperkalemia was treated through dialysis. So again, one of the key take homes from this is that um, just one dose of calcium in someone with uh, severe ECG changes is not likely to be enough. Uh, you treat uh, and you keep repeating the calcium till the ECG normalizes. And anyone uh, who's going to have uh, a death with hyperkalemia will be through cardiac arrhythmias. So as long as you can prevent the cardiac arrhythmias, there is no reason why someone's going to die from hyperkalemia. So the second goal or treatment goal number two is to shift the potassium into the cell to buy time till you can remove it uh, from the body, which is uh, goal number three. So the things we can do to shift potassium into the cell are to use insulin and glucose, albutrol or other beta-2 agonists, and bicarbonate if acidosis is present. So let's talk about each of these uh, next. So insulin will prom promote potassium entry into the skeletal muscle and the liver by increasing the sodium potassium ATPase activity. And this is independent of the glucose. Uh, Glucose is usually given to prevent hypoglycemia. So if someone is a diabetic and has sugar of more than 250, you can just, uh, and has hyperkalemia, you can just go ahead and give the insulin without uh, giving any glucose. The usual dose is 10 units of regular insulin IV and uh, supplemented with the glucose, uh, which can be 25 grams glucose, uh, which would be equal to 50 ml of a 50% dextrose. Uh, you should monitor for hypoglycemia over the next one to four hours, or uh, you could uh, ensure that the hypoglycemia doesn't happen by giving some 10% dextrose at around 50 ml, 50 to 70 ml per hour. The effect of insulin will uh, start within 10 to 20 minutes, peaks at around 30 to 60 minutes, and lasts for about four to six hours. The size of the effect or the amount of uh, potassium lowering is between 0.5 to 1.2 milliclons per liter. And uh, the insulin and glucose can be repeated or you can place someone on a drip of insulin and dextrose if the step three, which is removal of potassium from the body is going to take time or can't be accomplished um, within the three to four hours that the effect of the initial dose of insulin is going to last. Uh, another uh, shift uh, causing medicine is albutrol or other beta-2 agonists. However, the important thing to note with using albutrol is that the dose that causes hypo or causes a shift of potassium into the cell is 10 to 20 milligrams. The usual nebulizer uh, or, uh, or the usual dose is 2.5 milligrams. So you need to give four to eight times the usual dose. So you will need to specifically ask your nurse or whoever's giving the nebulization to mix four vials of your albutrol uh, for the nebulizer. 
the peak effect is 30 minutes if you're giving it IV and 90 minutes if you're giving by a nebulizer and the impact again lasts four to six hours. The size of the impact is 1.2 to 1.5 milliclons per liter and is additive to the insulin as well. And the duration is about four to six hours. Now the side effect, especially when you give this dose of albutrol is going to be tachycardia and tremors. And if someone has coronary artery disease and you're giving beta agonists, uh, you also worry about some angina. Uh, so this is one of the papers from 1990. And what it shows is in the um, circles, uh, uh, the empty circles is uh, just albutrol, uh, which by itself has some impact of uh, causing um, a drop in potassium. Uh, the uh, box filled boxes are just insulin and glucose alone. And then uh, the filled circles is insulin, glucose, and albutrol. And you can see that this is an additive effect where uh, both uh, albutrol and insulin glucose uh, um, add to each other's uh, hypokalemic effect. So now uh, coming to bicarbonate, which will also cause a shift of potassium into the cell. It is useful in acidotic patients. Um, there are multiple small studies in hemodialysis patients which have shown that bicarbonate in a hemodialysis patient it does not appear to be effective in those studies. And that is predominantly uh, due to a lot of those patients were not acidotic. Uh, this can be combined with other therapy. Usually people uh, would want to give it as a drip rather than a bolus because then you also get hypernatremia and uh, with a bolus dose of uh, bicarb and hypernatremia or hype, uh, osmolarity causes hyperkalemia as well. So in uh, treatment for hyperkalemia, um, you are better off giving isotonic bicarb over an infusion uh, by making bicarb with uh, D5 rather than uh, giving it as a push. The size of the impact is again 0.5 to 1 MEQ uh, molecular per liter and the duration of uh, the effect is four to six hours. So these um, three things, insulin, glucose, um, beta 2 agonists and bicarbonate, by the three to six hours before you can get to step three or goal three, which is to get potassium out of the body. And there are only three ways of doing that. Diuretics to help someone uh, get rid of potassium through the urine, dialysis or exchange raisins. So diuretics, uh, particularly IV furosemide, in my mind is uh, very underutilized uh, in the treatment of hyperkalemia. Uh, if someone is volume overloaded with a heart failure or cirrhosis or any other cause of volume overload, you can just give furosemide by itself. If someone is uvolemic, you can combine it with IV fluids and normal saline to help increase the distal delivery, which will in increase the potassium loss uh, that happens with uh, furosemide. So if someone has bad renal failure, whether it's acute renal failure or chronic renal failure, in that situation, hemodialysis is the preferred mode of potassium removal from the body and uh, should be initiated within four to six hours, especially in those who have um, ECG changes or symptomatic from hyperkalemia. Otherwise, uh, the hyperkalemia will re recur and uh, you will be back to where you started. Um, now let's talk about exchange raisins. So sodium or calcium polystyrene sulfonate are the most commonly used uh, treatment for hyperkalemia. In one of the abstracts that was presented, uh, they evaluated six months in an emergency review and they found that a thousand patients received uh, sodium polystyrene sulfonate uh, in sorbitol, um, while only 188 patients with hyperkalemia received any of the other treatments uh, for hyperkalemia. Um, in a commentary piece in 2010, uh, Rick Stearns uh, noted that it would be wise to exhaust all other alternatives for managing hyperkalemia before turning to exchange raisins. Um, because these were largely unproven and had potentially harmful um, side effects. So let's talk a little bit about these harmful side effects. And this is predominantly intestinal necrosis. Um, in a single center review of their pathology specimens over a 
uh, a nine year uh, period, uh, they found that there were 23 um, GI specimens that had um, SPS in the pathology specimen. And uh, after excluding anyone that had any other potential cause for necrosis, they found that there were 11 cases who had intestinal necrosis for which there were no other explanations other than the SPS that was received. All of them had gotten oral SPS and four of these patients died. Out of these 11, only two were post-op and four had end-stage renal disease. And the intestinal injury occurred within three hours to up to 11 days after the SPS had been given. Um, the um, rat studies that have been done with SPS, there was an original study uh, that Dr. Lillimo had done, which seemed to suggest that sorbitol and not SPS were the cause of intestinal necrosis. This more recent study where 26 rats who underwent first a 5-6 nephrectomy and were then divided into six groups and given enemas with just normal saline, 33% sorbitol, 33% mannitol, SPS in 33% uh, sorbitol, SPS in normal saline and SPS in distilled water. And what they found was only one sorbitol and one mannitol rat had some focal ischemic colonic changes, but all rats with SPS, no matter how it was given, had colonic necrosis and mucosal erosions. And 11 of the 13 rats with SPS died or were dying before 48 hours had passed, uh, suggesting that it is the SPS itself and not the sorbitol. Uh, in the original Lillimo uh, paper, uh, the sorbitol that they had used was a very high concentration, more than 70% sorbitol. And so that was one of the criticisms of the original paper, that the sorbitol that had been used was so concentrated that it was causing the necrosis and the SPS uh, uh, was not fully evaluated in that study. Um, since the 2010 uh, review by um, Rick Stearns, uh, there has been a further paper to assess the efficacy of uh, SPS in hyperkalemia. And this is 15 patients uh, who received SPS versus 16 who received placebo. And there was a drop of about 1.25 in those who received SPS versus 0.2 in placebo. So it does seem to work uh, even without uh, sorbitol and can lower potassium. Um, so my take home from uh, the evidence that is out there is that I would uh, try to avoid uh, using SPS and use diuretics and dialysis to remove potassium from the body. Um, however, if there is uh, no other alternative or dialysis is not available, um, in those situations you can consider and use SPS, but you should definitely never use it in the following situations. One, post-operative, anyone with any alias or any large or small bowel obstruction, anyone with any underlying bowel disease like inflammatory bowel disease or clostridium difficile, anyone who's been receiving opiates because of the decreased motility, and anyone with severe hypoperfusion or hypotension where the mesenteric uh, gut uh, as well as the possibility of ileus or slow motility um, may be there as well. And the US FDA does not recommend mixing SPS with sorbitol, though even in the US, majority of SPS is available pre-mixed in the hospitals with sorbitol. So now let's talk a little bit about some of the other potential therapies that might be available soon in India as well. And pateromer, which is an oral suspension, non-absorbed polymer, which exchanges calcium for potassium. And this is the 2015 uh, phase two, phase three study where uh, mild to moderate hyperkalemia, potassiums of 5.2 to 5.6 uh, received uh, pateromer uh, for a year. And uh, the potassiums were controlled uh, in the normal range for both mild and uh, moderate uh, hyperkalemia. They then went on to do a phase three uh, study as well in those with kidney disease and hyperkalemia receiving a renin angiotensin um, blockade. And uh, in the first part, uh, they gave uh, pateromer and the potassiums were normal, uh, normalized, and then they randomized these patients who had normal potassium on pateromer to withdrawal from pateromer, uh, which is on the right um, figure, uh, or continued uh, pateromer. 
and what they found was that uh, more around 50 percent had an increase in potassium which is the black line uh, to a potassium of more than 5.5 while those who continued on pateromer only 20 percent had an increase in potassium to more than 5.5 so pateromer allowed people to stay on renin angiotensin and al aldosterone blockade in the setting of kidney disease um, uh, in this situation uh, the adverse events in this study um, were predominantly uh, gi constipation and diarrhea and some hypomagnesemia another uh, medicine that is uh, likely coming in the near future is sodium zirconium uh, cyclosilicate which is a, again a cation exchanger and exchanges sodium and hydrogen for potassium and uh, in the NEJM paper they had uh, 753 patients with a potassium of more than five who uh, with a mean of 5.3 and they were randomized to multiple different doses of um, uh, zirconium at 1.25 2.5 5 and 10 grams three times a day with meals of zirconium or uh, they got placebo the outcome was what uh, the potassium was at 48 hours after initiation uh, those who were on placebo and 1.25 grams had a potassium of 5.1 those who got 2.5 had an average potassium of 4.9 5 grams got the potassium to 4.8 and 10 grams got it to 4.6 so there was a dose uh, dependent decrease in potassium uh, from a mean of 5.3 uh, down to 4.6 with the maximum dose of uh, zirconium. Uh, however, these are still early days and at present these are not available in India. So um, how uh, to use it and which situations and which one to use um, will uh, need to be figured out uh, once we have these more readily available and there is more data on uh, potential side effects uh, of these as well. So um, the other part of treatment is if someone is asymptomatic, how do we um, manage it? So first would be to identify the cause and see, um, and we depending on how severe the uh, hyperkalemia is, you can go ahead and treat as you would treat someone who is symptomatic. Uh, or if it is just mild hyperkalemia, you could even just address the cause. In many cases, uh, there are drugs that might be uh, withdraw withdrawable and then uh, the hyperkalemia resolves. Uh, if someone has hypoaldosteronism, uh, then you could even consider giving fludrocortisone uh, with uh, monitoring of uh, hypertension and volume uh, status as well uh, in those situations to see if uh, that is something um, that is warranted. Um, prevention of hyperkalemia. So just a couple of slides on that. Um, and this is something we talked in the previous talk on the basics of potassium as well and this is in terms of fasting and uh, this is uh, what happens when you give a glucose load to diabetics and non-diabetics so if you give glucose to a non-diabetic uh, the insulin that the person uh, produces and his pancreas produces causes a drop in the potassium which is the red dotted line uh, if you give it to a diabetic the uh, insulin doesn't increase on its own and the hyper osmolarity causes uh, hyperkalemia uh, similar uh, findings have also been uh, so uh, been seen in dialysis patients and so one of the things to remember is whenever we make uh, someone npo um, and fast them uh, they are at risk of developing hyperkalemia so giving them a small amount of d5 um, to help their endogenous insulin uh, be produced or if they're a diabetic to allow you to continue their maintenance insulin um, is important to prevent hyperkalemia and uh, prevent you uh, from having to do need to do dialysis or other hyperkalemic treatment right before surgery or any other procedure that you made them NPO for. Similar findings were also in a 1993 paper in dialysis patients who underwent an 18 hour fast. And if you look on the left, no infusion uh, was given to them. They had an increase of about 0.9 from 4.5 to 5.4 of potassium. If they got insulin and glucose, they kept their potassium right where they were at 4.7, 4.7. And if they got glucose alone, their endogenous insulin uh, helped decrease the rise in potassium those they still had some increase in potassium for 4.3 to 4.8 uh, 
and uh, the um, open boxes are um, those who got insulin and glucose and their potassium remains stable and the closed boxes are those who did not receive anything and their potassium increased by about 0.5 to 0.6 uh, over uh, the 18 hour fast. So one of the take homes is to make sure that you give some glucose or continue the insulin for patients um, who are diabetic or non-diabetic but are on a fast for um, procedures. So my summary is hyperkalemia is predominantly going to be due to either a cellular shift or decreased renal excretion. The treatment is if someone is symptomatic will comprise of calcium, insulin and beta 2 agonist and then uh, bicarb if they're acidotic. And then you have to call, uh, treat with removing the potassium from the body which will require either diuretics, dialysis or raisins and address the cause and the source of uh, hyperkalemia. Uh, so I would like to acknowledge Dr. Burton Rose, Dr. Vijay Khan, Dr. Cha, uh, and now I'll take any questions. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for a very crisp and an elegant talk on hyperkalemia. Uh, I request all the audience or listeners to please uh, present their question in question pane and I'll address to Dr. AJ. Uh, let me ask you a question. These resins and this intestinal necrosis, do you think the burden of injuries as much as it is portrayed? Because they are used uh, so often, we have no audit of the injury or evidence for injury in real clinic practice. How many such cases have you seen? So, so again, the problem is how do you prove that the reason someone passed away is due to intestinal necrosis and due to the SPS. So um, the, the number of people and the amount of SPS given across the world is uh, likely humongous. In, even in the US, uh, the most common treatment for hyperkalemia in most centers and most emergency rooms is SPS. Um, but knowing how often this happens is hard to do. If you look at just the paper that I presented, uh, this is a pathological specimen study where they had uh, autopsies or other uh, biopsies of the GI system. In one hospital over a nine year period, 11 people had colonic necrosis. So if we just extrapolate that to the rest of the world, that is still going to be a lot of people who developed or are, have may have colonic necrosis. Uh, it's hard to say how many of my patients or how many of patients who we've seen because most patients that you give this to may have many other comorbidities and uh, what is the etiology for their death or whether the even if they develop intestinal necrosis whether they had other etiologies for um, their intestinal necrosis may be almost impossible to prove. However, what my thought is, even one person who dies from colonic necrosis from SPS is probably one too many because we have other treatment modalities, whether it is diuretics or dialysis, that can help manage these patients. And the time that it takes for SPS to work is in many hours and there are other modalities that can bias the time till we get to the diuretic or the dialysis to kick in as well. So, so I'm not sure that we can't use other modalities to help control the potassium without and get away without giving SPS to a lot of our patients. Uh since rectum and colon have potassium excretory roles, is there any data on regular enemas causing potassium loss? Uh, so, um, any kind of diarrhea or any kind of uh, laxatives will cause potassium loss. So, others will cause um, loss of potassium. Any kind of diarrhea will cause some loss of potassium as well. Uh, again, using these uh, modalities, whether it is sorbitol or other laxatives, 
um, to cause or to treat um, hyperkalemia may get into some of the same problems because most of them are usually osmotic uh, agents. And then the osmotic agents, as was seen by sorbitol as well, may have similar issues in the setting of um, other high risk features for intestinal necrosis. So at present, we can hope for new therapies like patromer and uh, zirconium and see if once they arrive, what their uh, safety features and safety parameters are. Right. Thank you. And we'll of course have to wait for their safety features. We have a question from Professor Jha. How do you differentiate true versus pseudo hyperkalemia by serum and plasma tests? So um, usually most um, patients who have pseudo hyperkalemia will have it either due to one of two reasons. Uh, one is that the platelets or so if they have thrombocytosis or they have leukocytosis and those cells are leaking uh, the potassium, the plasma potassium where um, the plasma potassium is where the blood is not um, clotting may allow you to pick up uh, that leak and um, pick up that uh, the blood has not clotted and so you have checking it in plasma so uh, you will be able to pick up that the serum has hyperkalemia and a potassium of six but the plasma has a potassium of four and a half so you will be then uh, or let's say sickle cell in those kind of situations uh, you might be able to pick up that uh, the uh, plasma has a normal potassium while the serum has hyperkalemia uh, so that might be uh, one way of picking it up. Another would be that if the potassium varies widely in the same patient, most patients have a stable potassium. So you check them 10 times, uh, their potassium is going to be up and down between let's say 4 to 4.2 for one particular person. They're not going to vary from 4 to 6 to 4 again. So if someone's varying very widely on multiple repeated checks, uh, with everything else being normal, normal renal function and no other uh, issues going on, then it is very likely that there is some amount of pseudo hyperkalemia that is going on. So those are kind of usual clues that I would use for uh, pseudo hyperkalemia. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Sheetal. How do you deal with chronic hyperkalemia in dialysis patients? Any comments on dialysis potassium modeling? Uh, so, um, if you have uh, someone who's a dialysis patient with uh, persistent hyperkalemia, um, if you can boost their urine output and residual urine output, I would work on that. Uh, their diet is going to be a big feature of uh, discussion. And then the third would be the potassium bath that you have as well. And uh, you could consider um, going down from three to two or two to one. Um, but again, there are issues with larger swings of potassium during dialysis as well. Um, though the data on that is still unclear uh, in terms of uh, the outcomes. Uh, the other part was potassium uh, modeling. I'm not sure how useful that is going to be uh, in terms of uh, because the data for how much of arrhythmia or um, is due to the drop in potassium or due to the flux in potassium or the rebound in potassium. So that I think is still an open question at present. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Srinivasan. Role of fibrocortisone in sepsis induced hypoaldosteronism bracket hyperkalemia. So that is a, a very good question um, because there are any JM studies that uh, have suggested that uh, fludrocortisone um, or steroids with fludrocortisone uh, may be uh, important and may um, decrease mortality. Um, the problem is that these are one-off studies and they combined more than one intervention at the same time. So it's hard to know how much of the impact is from fludrocortisone, how much is it from other things that were done in the same time. 
so at present i wouldn't um, say that we are ready for using it uh, for everyone but i think uh, this is something that should uh, hopefully undergo some more studies and maybe a pragmatic trial might be one way of answering that question uh, another question from dr sheetal do we totally avoid fruits like mangoes and bananas in our dialysis patients any advice how they can enjoy it without hyperkalemia risk so the banana is interesting um because the banana is, is has a lot of potassium um if there is a resource um on the indian potassium intake um and the indian food potassium content and it um is published every year by the nutrition society and it's very interesting in um so whatever 90 page document but it's interesting a lot of fruits which i thought were high in potassium when you look at the indian content and the indian potassium in it uh, they are actually not that high in potassium uh, so whether it is some of the citrus fruits that we are classically taught whether it's lemon or uh, oranges uh, many of them are actually not that high in potassium um, so there are some of those that you can allow them and again many times what i'll tell my dialysis patients is um, to take it on their way to dialysis uh, so that we can wash out that potassium uh, that they've just had um, there and to not do it on their long weekends or the long holidays so again uh, i'm not sure there is good evidence for um, this but that's kind of what i tend to offer to my patients if they really have a fruit that they love to take it on their way to dialysis um and not do it on their three day weekend uh, i i'll ask another question lot of dialysis patients pre dialysis potassium is often 6 6.5 do you think they develop some sort of a tolerance to hyperkalemia because they often have no etg changes also at that level of potassium so so i'm not sure uh, there is adaptation from an ecg standpoint but uh, even in normal people if you look there is no good correlation of ecg changes to the level of potassium and that is because there are multiple other factors that go into the membrane excitability it will include the sodium the ph the calcium so i'm not sure it is that the dialysis patients by themselves have one particular feature to it it might be the combination that their calcium their ph their bicarb their sodium is such that uh, that is protective against the uh, cardiac arrhythmias or membrane excitability from the uh, potassium uh, that they have plus it's likely that they do it over time and slowly over the 3 days so that probably helps the body adapt as well another question from dr pratim what is the role of low or zero potassium bath in hyperkalemic dialysis patients yeah so that is again a complicated question and something that is debated a lot uh, whether you should do a zero potassium bath for someone who is let's say a potassium of 7 or 8 or a potassium of 1 or 2 is good enough so my uh, personal uh, this is now going to be personal opinion based rather than evidence based is that if you have a potassium of 7 or 8 and you're dialyzing them on a 1 or a 2 uh, you have enough of a gradient to drop their potassium significantly the only thing uh, that you will gain by zero is that you might avoid the possibility of them needing dialysis the next day because you drop it even more but there is the counter risk that the drop is so fast or uh, the change is so much that they have arrhythmias so in my mind i err on the side of safety and i would use a 1 or a 2k bath for most patients with 7 and 8 potassium and then plan for them needing another dialysis the next day Uh, another question dr pratim do you recommend bicarbonate profiling in dialysis hyperkalemic patients bicarbonate profiling uh, i wouldn't per se mostly because most dialysis patients on uh, their bicarbonates uh, usually run high 
And even if we are doing a regular dialysis with a bicarb of 32, we're going to correct any acidosis if they have any as well. So I don't usually try and profile the bicarb uh, as uh, uh, at all. Um, and the impact of bicarb on hyperkalemia and dialysis patients, especially giving by IV infusions, has been minimal. So I don't think uh, bicarbonate or uh, changing the bicarbonate too much is likely to make a big impact on the hyperkalemia in dialysis patients. Uh, since there are no more no questions here, Ajay, the case that you presented. No. Go yes. Fish. May I make a comment? Please, sir. Vijay Kheria, make make a comment. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Uh, uh, Ajay, that was that was. Yeah, Ajay, that was. You hearing me? No, uh, no this was unclear. Please come. Am again. I audible? Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes, you are audible. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. The comment I want is uh, somebody asked about uh, making zero potassium uh, and trying to dialyze a patient with hyperkalemia. And I think uh, we did this uh, mid dialysis study, which was putting a, a small. For about six months, and we found that actually the change in the drop in the potassium, the rapidity with which it dropped, was associated with the atrial fibrillation, which was the commonest arrhythmia, which was found in these patients. And this happened in patients, especially on Mondays and Tuesdays, when the duration of interval between the two dialysis had increased to three days rather than two days, which is the usual dial. So it suggests that actually the common practice of using zero potassium baths in patients who are hyperkalemic, trying to decrease the potassium to very low levels, may be counterproductive and in fact may be responsible for the cause sudden death, which occurs very commonly in patients on dialysis. And I think I would probably feel what Ajay said is that I would not use zero potassium baths. The, gradient from seven to two may be a reasonably good gradient uh, to protect them for rapid deterioration. So what I would do is if there is a patient who's got eight potassium in your diet, I would keep the potassium at four. And once the potassium is down, I might use in the second two minutes subsequently so that the gradients are not very high. The second comment I have is about the role of diuretics and decrease in the distal delivery to the potassium, which occurs in many patients of uh, chronic kidney disease. And I think we sort of overlook this as a cause for hyperkalemia in many of our CKD patients. So if you hydrate these patients and then give them a diuretic, I find that many times you don't have to dialyze these patients. You could get away by just increasing the diuretics and giving them some fluids itself and you might be Hello? able to avoid this back Hello? over to back to you yeah. yes go you yes go ahead Okay, thank you, Dr. Kher, for a nice comment. Your voice cracked, so I'll just summarize it uh, quickly for those who lost it. Dr. Kher was part of a large uh, MID study or monitoring in dialysis study where they studied ECGs continuously for six months on dialysis patients. The essential conclusions were increased prevalence of uh, or incidence of atrial fibrillation on dialysis, which was correlated with potassium gradient across the dialysate, especially on Monday, Tuesday, long interdialysis segment and bradycardia is preceding that. So basically he recommends avoiding high potassium gradient. You would rather do two dialysis if needed, that would be better. And hydrating and increased sodium delivery to distal tubules can avert certain dialysis in CKD patients. Thank you, Dr. Kher. Uh, Ajay, your case that you presented had a yeah. little fibrillation. Mm -hmm. Potassium was four in, four in the ER. 
and then yes. at 3 am the potassium is 8 and you have bradycardia yes. how do you explain this yes. rapid shuttling in the two extremes was one lab wrong no no the labs were fine um the hyperkalemia was as you saw with symptoms and ECG changes and when we repeated it before we started dialysis the potassium was 7.3 even though the ECG was now normal with all the treatment that we had given so this was true hyperkalemia and uh, the only explanation I have for her developing hyperkalemia over 12 hours from 4.5 to 8 is a combination of two features one fasting because she was um, brought from dialysis to the emergency and in the hospital she didn't get her meals so she was kind of um, fasting in the hospital uh, not intentional but just uh, by logistics because she was in the emergency and then got to the ICU and then the second was she got a lot of beta blockers first the esmolol drip and then significant amount of uh, metoprolol both oral and IV so the beta blockade plus the fasting is in my mind what led to the severe hyperkalemia she did not we went through um, all her medications as well as everything she got she did not have any oral potassium intake at all um, so this was all a fasting plus beta blockade induced uh, hyperkalemia um, and then uh, we treated her and then we did dialysis and the potassium came back to normal Brilliant. Uh, Dr. AJ, there are no more questions, uh, so I would uh, close this session. Thank you very much for a lovely talk, as well as uh, taking on uh, some questions which were stimulating as well as educative. Thank you everyone for being part of the webinar, and uh, have a good evening.